Hello, I'm Kurt Owen. Today, we're going to talk about if they've told you that you can't live, I'm going to tell you that you can and that Jesus promised that you could. We're also going to talk about how you can limit God with your unbelief and can prove it to you scripturally. And we can begin to see how Jesus is a healer and wants to heal you. We're also going to make this product available to you. Everybody needs to get this. It's absolutely free from our partners. For a donation of any amount, you're going to be able to get this pill bottle filled with scriptures and we're going to have a unique tactical tip to help you see better behind you when you need to. To succeed in life, we have to fight. That's why winners train spirit, soul, and body. We have to be ready. Not your typical minister, Kurt Owen left a successful career in private investigation and executive protection for the ministry over 20 years ago. His simple, practical application of God's Word will reveal how much Jesus loves you and give you the ability to fight to win. Now, get ready for a tactical tip from Pastor Kurt. Hello, on today's tactical tip, I want to talk to you a little bit about seeing behind you or uh, working on your situational awareness. Now, normally I teach this to EP professionals, but really it would work for anyone, uh, police, law enforcement. The reason I say EP professionals is sometimes we need kind of um, lower profile ways to look. And if you're constantly doing stuff like this, you're going to make people nervous, <laughs> okay? And, and you're going to draw attention to yourself, which really should be the last thing that you ever want to do even as a civilian or even as an officer, you, you, you'd like to avoid that. So I do need to see behind me though sometimes, right? And I would like to do it as smoothly as possible. Now, a lot of times people just turn their head like this and trying to see what's behind them. And you can get a field of view that way. But here's a little tip. Instead of doing this, do this. If you will lower your chin to your shoulder, you'll actually see deeper into the room behind you. And notice here, now I can do this with a cough, <coughs> and I'm, a, I'm able to see what's behind me. Now, if I need to turn a little bit, <coughs> it's a lot less obtrusive than me like doing this. And you do need to be practicing your situational awareness. If you hear a sound behind you, if something sounds different behind you, please don't just stand there ignoring it. Turn and look behind you. Welcome back to Fight to Win. Uh, this is going to be our second week on healing. Uh, I strongly recommend you go back and listen to everything I ministered last week. Even if you heard it, you need to listen to it. In fact, uh, during the break when uh, Jeff and I were switching, I was switching shirts and he was switching all his stuff. I was telling Jeff about how much, uh, there's just so much I want to tell you that I'm not able to tell you. And he said, that's the reason you got product. And that's exactly true. This is here for you to fix your heart and your mind on what the Word of God says. And for me to be able to share with you actually in far more depth than what I'm able to do here on television. So I ask you to once again contact the ministry and get this is absolutely free. Now we are going to give you the opportunity for any gift uh, that you give. Uh, you'll receive one of these bottles filled with healing scriptures, but we'll talk a little bit about it later. But there's a lot I'm not going to be able to share with you. One of the things that really, if you were to ask me what I ministered last week, it was to settle the issue that God the Father is interested in healing and He's interested in healing you. And the reason that that is important is because sometimes people get this idea about Jesus and His ministry that once Jesus, that healing was only during Jesus' ministry and that once Jesus left or once his apostles left, that healing was done and passed away and that was it and boop, it's all gone. Well, here's the problem with that. If healing was before Jesus, why wouldn't healing continue after Jesus goes back to be with heaven? If he was just doing the will on the Father on the earth and the will of the Father was the same before he came, while he was here, and then after he's gone to heaven, why wouldn't the will of the Father remain the same, which means that his desire to heal remained the same? Okay? Um, and again, I'm going to, all you people that want to argue about Job and the false thorn and Tremotheus, if you want to argue about that, okay, I'm going to deal with you about it. 
I just need you to get an understanding of, did God want to heal before Jesus? Yes. Did God want to heal during Jesus? Yes. Does God want to heal now that Jesus has come to live on the inside of us, and that, but physically he's gone to heaven? Yes. There is no shadow of turning in him, it's his desire. Now, last week I said some things that probably upset you guys because it is a really big thing for people to say, no man is promised tomorrow. No man is promised tomorrow. Well, you know, uh, you just got to stay ready to go and, and all this other stuff. And again, I want to go back to the curse of the law just so that we're clear. We're in Deuteronomy 28 in verse six, uh well, before we get to verse 66, in verse 15 it says, Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, But it shall come to pass that if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of His commandments and His statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Now here's one of the curses. Verse 66, Your life shall hang in doubt before you, you're, you shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. In other words, for your life to hang in doubt before you and for you to have no assurance of life, that is a curse. If that is you, you are un operating under the curse of the law. And that's pretty bad because Galatians 3.13 says... Christ has redeemed me from the... Oh, excuse me, I'm reading it like it's to me. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. As it is written, curses is everyone that hangs on the tree. Now, I would recommend you go back and listen to last week, especially the part, even though I wasn't getting in a whole lot of depth about it, but listen to the part where I talked about putting your Bible together like this and, and putting these two together and realizing that every sickness and every disease is under the curse of the law. And Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Listen, I, I've done that for hours. Now there's more that I've had to, to add to it it's because I've learned some things and some ways to apply it. But renewing your mind to, I don't have to have this. It is this, every sickness and every disease is under the curse of the law. People say, again, people say, well, no, some sickness is a blessing. God said every sickness and disease was a curse, so one of you is lying about it, and I choose you. Um, so, now, again, people say, yeah, but your life does hang in doubt before you because this is what James says. And so I want to deal with that before we switch subjects here today. Not subjects as far as healing, but right now we've been concentrating on the Father, and I want to talk a little bit more about Jesus himself and what he said and did when he was in the earth. But in James chapter 3, this is the book. The, people pray this wrong all the time. And it says this in verse 13. He says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a, a little time and vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Now, people pray about healing all the time. Uh, well, Lord, heal Jeff if it be your will. That is a wrong application of this verse completely. Okay? And Jesus never did that. Paul never did that. Peter never did that. So why are you doing that? Okay? Why? Well, yeah, but that's what it says. And you just said your life wouldn't hang in doubt before you. You're right. Well, then you're wrong. You're wrong about that. <laughs> I'm not wrong. I'm right. People say, well, but yeah, you just read. Yeah, but there's a context to this. The, he's telling them, you don't, not, you, you don't know whether you're going to be alive tomorrow. But who is he talking to? This is verse 13 of chapter 4. Let's start in verse 1 of chapter 4 to see who he's talking to. Where do, you, do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desire for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you might spend it on your own pleasures. Notice this. 
adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the God or friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of God makes himself an in, excuse me. Whoever therefore wants to be a be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in you yearns jealousy? Now, then he goes on here to say this, verse 30. He says, but God, uh, God gives grace more, to more grace. Therefore, he said, God resists the, gr the proud and gives grace to the humble. Again, talking to these people. Therefore, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and prove you are your heart and your double-minded. Now, to my knowledge, this is the only time in Scripture that a born-again Christian is called a sinner. It's the only time. Now, how, people say, how do you know he's talking about born-again uh, Christians? Well, go back to verse 2 of chapter 1. My brethren. <laughs> he's talking to Christians. Now, let me just say, if this is the type of Christian you are that's in verse chapter 4, where you murder and covet and cannot obtain, if you're adulterer and adulteress, right? If you are a friend with the world and an enemy of God, let me just say, let me just say, your life does hang in doubt before you and you have no assurance of life. You are sowing to the flesh, you will reap corruption, and for you to say that you'll even be here tomorrow is arrogance because you are acting outside, completely outside the will of God. You are sowing completely to your flesh and you're going to reap corruption and if that's you, stop it. You're destroying your own life. But this part, this scripture where he says that don't say that you will do this and tomorrow, that you don't know whether you're even going to be here basically, that's not talking to every Christian. That is talking to people who have sown to their flesh and they're reaping corruption. That it is only the mercy of God you've lived this long. If that's you, yeah, knock yourself out. Play if the Lord wills, I'll be here tomorrow. But that's not me. I'm doing everything I can to serve God. And when I see I'm making a mistake, I try to repent it and quit it. And I do make mistakes. But it, let me share, you, share with you the testimony of a man that wasn't in that condition. This is in Philippians. And um, he says this, he's talking about... Um, um, he, he's verses verse 19 he, he's in jail and um, they, by the way there, he's a, kind of awaiting execution he's in the Philippian jail and he says this for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the supply of the spirit of, of Jesus Christ now I would strongly ask you to be praying for me because your prayers could turn out my deliverance I don't always like it that that's true but your prayers really help me and I need them, okay? That's part of your partnership with me. Don't just send me your money, send me your prayers. All right, send the money too, but because we need it. You, you understand there's bills to pay. I gotta, we gotta stay on television. It says this, now notice, according to my earnest expectation that in my, in hope that I, in nothing I may be ashamed with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether in life or in death. Now notice, now he's going to go around and he's going to talk about the situation he's in. For me to live is, is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, it, this will mean more fruit for my labor. Now notice this. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. Now this is a man awaiting execution. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. What just happened? <laughs> Paul, a man in prison. I don't know what that was, but it's gone now. Uh, a man in prison, awaiting to be executed. You just dealing with sickness and disease. He's got by guys walking by his cell every day, sharpening their axe, wanting to take his head. And he said, they're not choosing what day I die. 
The devil's not choosing what day I die. Sickness and disease is not choosing what day I die. I get to choose when I leave. I do. And he says in this, he's in the midst of making a decision. I don't know what I'm going to do. To, to, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Man, that would be awesome. To depart and to be bet with Christ is far better. But man, these people need help. What I choose, I don't know. But you know what? It's better for you if I stay in the earth. So you know what? I've made my decision. I'm going to go ahead and stay in the earth. Did his life hang in doubt before him? Was he praying, if the Lord wills, I'll be here tomorrow? Or did he say it was his decision? It was his decision. Well, how could he do that? Because he was not an adulterer and adulteress. He was not murdering and coveting and cannot obtain. And even though he did some things wrong, he was endeavoring with all his heart to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And his life did not hang in doubt before him. And evidently he had assurance of life. So, if you are a James chapter 4 Christian, first, why? God is in love with you. Why would you continue to sow after your own flesh? Why would you continue to yield to your own flesh? Why would you do that? The better life is serving God. It doesn't take away from you. It pays. Why would you continue in sin? Why would you continue in pornography? Why would you continue in, in, in making choices? And, and listen, in, in choosing each day to go against the will of God for your life. You're in a job you're not supposed to be in. You're, and I'm not talking to married people now, but you're in a relationship you're not supposed to be in, either with a friend or, or with a man or a woman, and you're not married. And Why are you doing that? Why don't you want to do the will of God for your life? Do you think it will rob you? By not doing the will of God for your life, you end up in the James chapter 4 group. But if you will make a decision to walk with God, you can be in the Philippians chapter 1 group. I have not yet decided whether to go or whether to stay. This is why people always tell me, they say, well, I'll pray that you'll come back. You don't have to pray that I'll come back. I'm coming back. You can pray that I, I be preserved. You be pray for my life. You can contend with me that my life is hid in God and no man can take it. You can pray, pray that I tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt me. But I'm coming home to my wife and daughter. My life is hid in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have chosen to stay for your good and for my wife and daughter's good. What about you? It is a religious lie. People say, well, when your day is up, your day is up. There is no day. It is appointed unto every man once to die. That's true, but the day is not chosen. Scripture can proved that to you over and over again. You can look at Hezekiah. You can look at Psalm 91. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Okay, what? Well, you're not satisfied, so live on. What about what Moses said? What about when he said that, um, that men should live, talking about people that had rebelled against God, you shall live 70 years or by reason of strength 80. That means there's not a day picked. I'm telling you that if you're laying in a hospital bed, you can declare today, then, my time, I, then this is not my time. I'm not leaving. God has not chosen my time. It is up to me whether I live or stay. And now, but, but listen, you can't just do that. You've got to get these truths. That's the reason I want you to get this product absolutely free. And if you're in a hospital and they've given you a death sentence or you're not in the hospital and they've given you a death sentence, then write the ministry and say, hey, they've given me a death sentence. Get it to me right away and we'll, we will get there. Because people say, why would you do that? Because we firmly believe that this teaching will change your life forever. And we want you to have this. Go to KurtOwen.com. Go to FightToWin.tv. There are truths in here that will stir you up. There, this can be your Bible study. And you can receive your healing. Amen. I'd show you the bottle, but that's what fell. So, um, so here's the thing. The Father's will has always been and always shall be that every sickness is, uh, disease is under the curse of the law, but I want you blessed. And that I blessed you for a reason. And that healing belongs to you. 
Now, I've got a question for you. This is, and this is where we're going to start. This is kind of a new topic. Same subject, new topic. Jesus, what was his attitude towards healing? How did he look at healing? Um, I want you to, we're going to uh, look in uh, Luke chapter 4. Now, we learn from a couple different places in Scripture that this, this is Jesus in his own hometown. And uh, we're going to look at several things uh, in this uh, account. Um, or we'll compare two accounts. But in this, this is what Jesus, this was really the first message that Jesus preached everywhere he went. We know that from something that Peter said later, I think, in the book of Acts. And this is what Jesus would, in verse 16, uh, Luke 4, 16. So he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he'd opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now notice here, this is his mission. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty, proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, that's healing, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, that's also sickness and disease. Um, we know that from later on in Scripture. And to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. His mission was healing. His mission was healing. In fact, he's going to try to get, let's look at this account. Um, I think this account is in Matthew, Mark 4 as well. In Mark chapter 4, um, no, it wouldn't be in Mark 4. That's the parable of the sower. Maybe it's Mark 6. Mark 6. Now this is in his, when he's in his own hometown. By the way, nobody likes this message. When Jesus, this is a message of hope. I don't know if you got that, but um, I lost my place. But Luke chapter 4 where it says this. He says, uh, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, that's pretty positive. There's nothing negative in that, but they hate Him for it. And he says, uh, then he closed the book and gave it to the attendant and sat down and all the eyes of all those who were in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth and said, basically, who are you, dude? Aren't you Joseph's son? And then he, they start to attack him. Verse 28 says, all those who were in the synagogue when they heard these things were filled with wrath and rose up to thrust him out of the city and they led him to the brow of the hill on which he, their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. But then passing, by, passing through the midst of him, he went his way. So these guys didn't like messages of healing either <laughs> too much. Um, I want you to see something here, though, that happened during this account. It says that um, in um, verse 4, it talks about where, and we're in uh, Mark 6, 4. He says, and he said to them, a prophet is not with honor except in his own country and among his own relatives and in his own house. And it says, Now he could do no mighty work there except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled at their unbelief. Then he went about in the villages in a circuit teaching. Now there's a lot in this, okay? First off, Jesus showed up desiring to heal. That's what the message was about, desiring to help people. The message was rejected. Notice there how bad Jesus wants people healed, though. In verse 5, it says, though now he could do no mighty work there. Now, notice there's an interesting word there. It doesn't say he would do no mighty work there. He said he could. In other words, he was trying to. In fact, when it says, except he laid his hands on a few sick people, literally it means minor ailments. Okay? But he couldn't do any mighty work there. Not because he didn't want to, but because he couldn't. Because of their unbelief. Now, so, so we're in a position where you have a situation where Jesus wants to heal. Now, why does he want to heal? Because he's God and because God wants to heal. The Father wants to heal. The Son wants to heal. The Holy Spirit. They're three in one. One being manifested three different ways. They want to heal. But Jesus himself, 
He wants to heal so bad. He's laying hands on people. There's not a pretty, very good shot they're going to receive. But he's still doing it. Why? Because he's got a burning in them to heal them and to help them. But he cannot heal them. He can do no mighty work there because they won't believe. And he's, they have limited his ability to help him. They have limited him in his desire to help him. Well, I don't believe that. You don't have to believe me. You can believe this. There he could do no mighty work except he laid his hands on a few sick, sick people and healed them. Sounds like he wanted to do more, but they wouldn't let him. What caused it? Their unbelief. They chose not to believe. Now he tried to fix it because it says then he went about in the villages on a circuit teaching. Right? He, and what's the cure for unbelief? Being taught. That's what I'm trying to do to here now. And see, if you're sitting there just like them going, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Well, then keep listening. Let me teach you. Let's get the product. Listen to these things over and over again. Go to KurtOwen.com. Allow the partners of Kurt Owen Ministries to bless you with this so that you're, you will live long in the earth. God has a plan for your life. Do not allow sickness and disease to take you out. Go to fighttowin.tv and get this product today. This will help you, but don't go too far. I want to pray with you. Come right back with me. Does God care about healing? If so, who does he want to heal? Pastor Kurt Owen addresses these questions and more in this audio series from a recent Healing School conference. We're offering this audio series for free as our gift to you. Also, for a donation of any amount, we'll send you this medicine bottle with healing scriptures and confessions you can read and speak daily as your prescription from the great physician. Get yours today on our website, fighttowin.tv, or by calling 1-800-215-0428. Hello, I'm Kurt Owen. Have you been to our YouTube channel? I'm going to ask you to go there today. We need at least 1,000 subscribers on the Fight to Win uh, with Kurt Owen YouTube channel and the Kurt Owen YouTube channel. Would you go there and subscribe for us? It would help us greatly. Not only that, there's a lot of great content there. There are services there that are not available on our regular television show or on our TV site. Go to YouTube and subscribe to Kurt Owen and Fight to Win TV with Kurt Owen. Thank you very much. Don't forget about this product, Healing School, absolutely free. Let us teach you. The other thing is, is we do have this. Uh, for those of you to give any amount of donation, we're going to send this bottle to you absolutely free, filled with healing scriptures just to bless you. Now, maybe I've said some things. that Maybe you've been limiting God. And maybe you had help. Maybe you had preachers that taught you that it wasn't God's will to heal everybody. Maybe they taught you that you couldn't limit God, and yet you can see clearly from the scripture that Jesus was limited. You can see that Jesus wanted to heal somebody, but he wasn't able to because of what went on in them. Let's try to fix this in our lives, shall we? Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift them up, I lift me up. Lord, I ask you by your spirit to reveal to us the truth so that we do not limit you anymore in any area of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.